Hello everyone and welcome back to another video in our series in which we finish off our exploration of the lungs. So what we're going to be doing is continuing on from our previous series in which we were sort of looking at the key structures of the upper and lower respiratory tract, looking at our conduction zones and our respiratory zones. But what we're going to be doing now is taking it a little bit further and looking at sort of the mechanisms in how we actually breathe as well as looking at the biochemistry of how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported around the body. So just a quick recap on what we did do in the previous series is we looked at pulmonary ventilation. So to translate this, what this essentially means is the ability for our lungs to move air in and out. So pulmonary meaning lungs and ventilation to ventilate, to move air around. Now, the main mechanism in which we do this is by a pressure gradient. So we rely upon a change in pressure. As with any gas, it wishes to move from high to low. So as we breathe in, as we inhale, what we are doing is our lungs are expanding. And we do this by pulling our diaphragm down and pulling our rib cage up and out. What this serves to do is increase our intrapulmonary volume. So by increasing the intrapulmonary volume, we are going to then decrease the intrapulmonary pressure. Now, as I said before, air moves from high to low pressure, which means it's going to move from our surrounding environment down and into my lungs. So what we're gonna be doing now is just having a look at airway resistance. Now, in one of our previous series, we looked at resistance, but we looked at it with blood vessels. Well, now that we're looking at the lungs, instead of looking at the movement of blood, we're going to be looking at the movement of air. Now, here's the thing is that when we are looking at the movement of air through our airways, when we start at the very top and starting at our trachea, it is sort of one big pipe, essentially. But what happens is as we move further and further down our lungs, down sort of to our bronchi and then bronchioles, what we typically see is those airways get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, this should contribute to a greater degree of resistance, as we sort of discussed when we were looking at blood. But that's not what we see, primarily because it's not just one airway still. Yes, those airways are getting smaller, but we have more and more of them. This gives us a great degree of control over the amount of resistance that we can see in our airway. So, for instance, in the same way that we can vasoconstrict and vasodilate, we can also bronchoconstrict and bronchodilate to control the amount of air that is moving into and out of our lungs. And we don't need all of our lungs fully dilated and fully open all of the time. There's just no need. So what we can see here, we can actually increase bronchoconstriction in times when, say, we are sort of at rest. We don't need huge uh, amounts of airflow. And of course, we can bronchodilate if we are uh, needing more air into our lungs. So if I start running, for example. Now, there are some instances in which we do experience bronchoconstriction when we don't want it to happen. So a perfect example of this is asthma. So asthma is an uncontrolled smooth muscle contraction or uncontrolled bronchoconstriction of the airways. This is why when someone is having an asthma attack, they have that horrible wheezy breath because they are unable to really open up their lungs and get that air in because there's too much airway resistance. Now, what I'd like to do is drag your attention to this wonderful graph. So this graph here is essentially a representation of your lungs volume and lung capacities. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we can break this down into a couple of different sections. So what we have here, this nice oscillating curve, is our tidal volume. This is essentially the amount of air that you are quietly breathing in and breathing out. So this is just your regular, everyday, quiet breathing. Now, as you breathe in, breathe out, and then breathe in, but then we can see this gigantic spike at the top here. This big spike is the inspiratory reserve volume. This is essentially how much air you can breathe in on top of a regular inhalation. So what we're seeing here is that with our tidal volume, this is your passive breathing or quiet breathing. And then if you were to, after a passive inhalation, do a big forced inhalation where you're really opening up your lungs as much as you can, then what you are doing is utilizing your inspiratory reserve volume. 
Now, if you combine both of those values together, you get your inspiratory capacity. Essentially, the maximum amount of air that you can inhale at one point. Then again, what we see in this graph is sort of regular tidal breathing. Then you exhale, so a quiet exhalation. And then we have our expiratory reserve volume. So in the same way, like with our lungs, when we breathe in passively, and then we took a big forceful inhalation. What we're seeing here is the same thing, but with an exhalation. So if I was to passively exhale and then do a forceful exhalation, then I'm seeing my expiratory reserve volume. Now, the functional residual capacity is essentially how much air I've got left in my lungs after a passive exhalation. But we can see this little piece of volume down here, this residual volume. Well, what that describes is the volume of air left in your lungs after you do a forced exhalation. We are unable to completely empty our lungs of all the gas in there, no matter how hard we try. So this is sort of the leftover amount of air that exists in the lungs. And that's going to be important in a moment when we talk about the alveolar ventilation rate. Now we have our vital capacity. The vital capacity essentially describes the amount of air that we can voluntarily move per breath. So what I mean by that is that if I was to do a forceful inhale to breathe in as much air as I can possibly fit in my lungs and then exhale as hard as possible, like trying to breathe out every last drop of air in my lungs as possible, that would be my vital capacity. Now, if we take our vital capacity and we add in that residual volume, that is the total lung capacity. That is the total amount of air that my lungs can fit at any time. Understanding how we move air in and out of our lungs and also understanding the volumes or the capacity that our lungs have, what we can do now is compare different types of breathing. So if we were to have a normal rate and depth of breathing with a tidal volume of around 500 mils, which is about average, and if we have a respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute, what we see is about 10 liters being ventilated per minute. Now, what we can do here is actually compare three different types of breathing. So just your, your regular normal breathing. Then we've got some slow, deep breathing in which the rate of breathing is halved, but the volume that we are moving is doubled. And then we've got the other side. We've got rapid, shallow breathing. So we've halved the tidal volume, but we've doubled that respiratory rate. So what we see here is the minute ventilation rate is 10 liters. So basically, regardless of how we were breathing there, because we appropriately adjusted our rate and the volume, we were moving 10 liters per minute. But is that how much we were able to use? Because we have something called alveolar ventilation rate. Now, what alveolar ventilation rate is essentially how much of that air that we are breathing in, how much of that is actually getting right down into our lungs for us to properly use for gas exchange. Well, this is where we run into a bit of a conundrum because we have that anatomical dead space, that residual volume that's left in our lungs that we can't breathe out. What this means is, is that if I do an inhalation, what I'm going to be doing is I'm gonna be taking that oxygen, moving it through into my blood and taking out carbon dioxide. I then do an exhale in which I'm breathing out that old air. Now. Here's the thing, I cannot breathe out all of that air because I can't empty out that anatomical dead space, that residual volume. So if I do another inhalation, that fresh air that I'm breathing in right now is actually mixing in with that old stale anatomical dead space, that old air that was in my lungs from the previous breath. And what that does is it actually kind of almost dilutes the air, I guess you would say. And it means that it has a lower partial pressure of oxygen and higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide, something we're gonna be talking about in a moment. Now, this plays a big role in our alveolar ventilation rate. So as you'll recall, we had three different types of breathing, the normal breathing, slow and deep breaths and fast and shallow breaths. Now we were still moving the same amount of air, 10 liters per minute. But if we compare the three, we can see that that slow, deep breaths has a far more effective alveolar ventilation rate than compared to the rapid, shallow breathing. Why is that, you may ask? 
Well, having that slow, deep breath means more air is able to mix with that anatomical dead space and remove that old air. Whereas if you're doing sort of that slow, shallow breathing, it's not adequate enough to really get right down into the lungs and remove that old gas. This is why if someone is in pain or having an anxiety attack or something like that, uh, more often than not, the advice there is to slow down your breathing, slow, deep breaths, not to sort of do those shallow, fast, panicky breaths. Because what we see here is that, sure, they're still moving the same amount of air, but it's not getting right down into the alveoli there for effective gas exchange. And that, of course, is the aim of the game. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. So just a refresher, when we are looking at moving these gases around the body, what are we trying to do here? So we have two main versions, external respiration and internal respiration. So external respiration is when we exchange gases between blood and the lungs. So previously, when we were looking at the alveolar ventilation rate, we were trying to ventilate or, or move that air right down into the alveoli so we can undergo this external gas exchange. So we can move that oxygen into the blood and remove that carbon dioxide from the blood. Then what's going to happen is that oxygen is going to move via hemoglobin proteins in our red blood cells and be transported to our tissues. From there, the oxygen will then move into our tissues and we will remove carbon dioxide and transport it back to the lungs. So that exchange of gases between the blood and tissues, that is internal respiration. 